Self with Upadi or the costume of avidya or ignorance is called Jiva. The same self with the costume of Maya is called Ishvara. Even Upadi Veda Jiveshwara Bhedrushtihi Yavat Pariyam Tam Tishthadi. Therefore, the real Different, the difference that is felt between Jiva and Ishvara is only on account of the upadhi, the costume, and giving reality to the costume only, Jiva takes himself to be a limited being and takes Ishvara to be different from himself. Sasmad Ishwaram Bhinnatve Nidanadi Prakritya. By nature, this Jiva takes Ishvara to be different from himself, then Ishvara becomes a goal, one to be sought something that is trying to become, something that is searching for. And that is how, when the goal is thought to be different from oneself, there is constantly a process of becoming, a process of searching for. Unfortunately, the goal is similar to the tenth man, who is in effect searching for his own self. And therefore, yavat pariyantam tishthati, as long as this distance, which is in fact on account of only identifying the costume. Same self. Not that there are two entities, one self alone having two costumes. He alone is called Jiva, he alone is called Ishvara. But anyway, same self suffers from a sense of limitation because of ignorance. Now this is the whole thing. Who is who is going through the samsara? Well the self is going through samsara. Then Brahman is going through samsara because there is only one entity, Brahman, there is nobody else. The only conscious entity or only entity in the creation is Brahman. And therefore, whoever is feeling the samsara, sense of limitation, also is Brahman. The one who is struggling to become free also is Brahman. One who, one who takes for granted the distance between the seeker and the sort also is Brahman. And Tavat Pariyantam as long as the reality is given to one's own sense of limitation. And 
the person is trying to become free from limitation through some effort. So long, one can never be free from the limitation because it's a sense. If limitation was real, then perhaps one could become free also, but in as much as the limitation is just a notion, is a sense. A notion can only go by knowledge and not by anything else. Just a notion of snake can only go by the knowledge of rope and not by any other method. And so also a notion of sense of limitation only can go by the knowledge of the true nature of oneself and not by any process. Tasmat karanat nijeveshwara buddhi svikarya jeveshwarya ho bhed buddhi svikarya And therefore, first thing to do is na svikarya. One should not accept bhed buddhi that sense of duality, the difference Jeevaishwarya ho between Jiva and Ishwara. The Ishwara, that Satchit Ananda is different from me. That I am Asat, I am Achit, I am Anananda, I am mortal being, I am ignorant, I am unhappy. And happiness, knowledge, immortality is all away from me. That I to become immortal, or to become all-knowing, or to become happy. This buddhi, this conclusion one should not accept. Because accepting that conclusion is sure not to ever be successful because one cannot become what one already is. The tenth man cannot search for the tenth man, cannot ever find tenth man because the one who is finding himself is the tenth man. <coughs> Therefore, this Bheda Buddhi, the sense of limitation, Nasvikarya, one should not accept or give reality to the sense of limitation. This is the, this is what Vedanta teaches. And therefore, Upanishad says, Tena Tyaktena Bunjithaha. Let there be Tyaga, let there be all the time renunciation of the sense of limitation. And what is meant by renunciation of sense of limitation is whatever other notions arise from sense of limitation. This sense of limitation makes me feel insecure, makes me feel threatened, therefore makes me depend, defensive, makes me self-centered. And from that alone arise all these likes and dislikes. So attachments, aversions, fear, all of these are the product of this insecurity that I'm feeling and that is because this notion is taken to be real. And so whatever I do is originated from a sense of insecurity, from fear, from self-centeredness, from likes and dislikes. And as long as that happens so long that likes and dislikes, they only get a light lease. They in fact perpetuate because I have given reality to my attachments and aversions. I have given reality to those needs, given reality to my self-centeredness, to my insecurity, to my smallness. And whatever I do is only going to perpetuate that sense of smallness. Therefore, tena tyaktena bhunjithaha. May you gain this knowledge by tyaga or renunciation, the sense of smallness. That it is mitya. That it is a projection. It is arising out of taking what you are not to be yourself. Identifying with your costume. That is what brings about this sense of limitation. Don't accept it. But I feel it. Still don't accept it. Meaning that, do not accept whatever feelings arise from a sense of limitation or insecurity because they do not represent your true nature. Therefore, do not base your life on this. Do not base your life on being a needy person because that need is a product of ignorance. Then one becomes a consumer. So, giving up the sense of limitation becomes means giving up the sense of consumership and becoming a contributor. That's what it means. So that's the kind of transformation that has to come in our life. Then so all the time asking and demanding for favor, let me become a contributor. This is how Lord Krishna teaches the first step of renunciation, which is Karma Yoga. And what Vedanta teaches renunciation in terms of the identification with the Pancha Kosha of the, of the three bodies, which brings about the sense of limitation. 
But you say that I should give up the sense of how can I give it up? Nanu sahankara se kinjidnya se jiva se nirhankara se sarvagnya se ishvara se tattu masidi mahavakyat kratham abhed buddhisyat uvayoho virud dharma krantatvat. You are teaching us that you are Brahman. So you are telling us that you are Brahman. How can that be? Brahman is God. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. And I am just a little individual, limited in every way in knowledge, my capacity, in power, every way I am limited. How can it be that these two totally two entities possessing totally contradictory attributes, how can they be one? <coughs> so this is the problem. And that problem naturally arises in my mind. Even when Upanishad teaches that, hey, you are free, you are limitless, you are Brahman, you are Shiva. But according to me, who is Shiva? Shiva is the one who lives in, on the Mount Kailas. I can never be Shiva. He says, you are Krishna, suppose I say, you are Narayana. Who is Krishna? who lifts the whole mountain on the little finger. I can't do that. How can you say I am Krishna? How do you say I am Shiva? How do you say I am Brahma? How do you say I am God? Where is he? All powerful, all knowing. And where am I? How can these two be the same? How can they be identical? And naturally this question arises on account of hanging on to my sense of limitation. Not inquiring into why do I feel limited. That I feel limited or small or insignificant is does it represent the true nature of myself or is it something that I have taken for granted? Or when the Upanishad says Tattvam Asi, Tvam, you, Tat Asi, you are Brahman, which you is meant. When Upanishad says you are Brahman, does it mean that the ego is Brahman? Is it what is meant? That I who is identified as the body, therefore I who looks upon myself as an ego, looks upon myself as subject to birth and death, I who take myself as a limited being, am I Brahman? Is it what is meant? So when Upanishad teaches us Tattvamasi, that thou art, or you are Brahman, or you are limitless, when this is the teaching, what is the meaning of you? What you is there when the teacher says you are Brahman? What is in the mind of teacher when the teacher uses the word you? Or you are that. So when they said that, or Shiva, you are, then what is the meaning of the word Shiva? Or what is the meaning of Narayana? Or what is the meaning of the word God? And therefore, this must also become very clear, which I is addressed. <clears throat> that pronoun I that is used to denote me, where does it really go? Or what does it refer to? <clears throat> I have my own notion about who I am. And I have my own notion about who God is. And therefore, this identity between myself and God is impossible. So the teacher now next clarifies what is meant by the pronoun you and what is meant by the pronoun that. When it said that you are that, what is the meaning of the pronoun you and what is the meaning of the pronoun that? What is the meaning of the, pronoun, what's the, what's the meaning of the individual being? What is the meaning of Brahman? So what is meant by the pronoun tat and tvam? Thou and that in the statement that the word so that's that's explained in the next sentence the page 38 iti ched na sthula sukshma sharira abhimane tvam padavachyarthah upadivinir muktam Samadhi Dasha Sampannam 
ಶುದ್ಧ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪದಲಕ್ಷ್ಯಾರ್ಥ ಸೊ ಇದು ಅನಾಲಿಸಿಸ್ ಆಫ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ದ ಮೇಜರ್ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ದಟ್ ಟು ವಿಚ್ ದ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ ರಿಸ್ಪಾನ್ಸ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದಟ್ ಸೋಹಮ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಮಹಾವಾಕ್ಯ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಂಗ್ ಅನಲೈಸ್ಡ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಯು ನಾಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಅ ವಾಕ್ಯ ಆರ್ ಅ ಸ್ಟೇಟ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆರ್ ಅ ಸೆಂಟೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಕಂಪ್ರೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಸೆಂಟೆನ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಈಚ್ ವರ್ಡ್ ಈಸ್ ಯೂಸ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆಂಟೆನ್ಸ್ then alone we can understand the meaning of the sentence this is a very short sentence that thou art you are that then we should understand the meaning of what is meant by the pronoun you meaning of what is meant by pronoun that and meaning of what is meant by the are that just shows the identity between the two <coughs> so meaning of pronoun you or thou or i is explained in the passage that we just read in the chat if this is your doubt or if this is your question how can i be brahman where is brahman is limitless almighty how can i be i am in every way limited how can an entity that is limited in every way be identical to that which is limitless how can it be in the chat if this is your doubt now the answer is no your doubt is not right why because the word you as you understand is different from the meaning in which we are employing it so teacher all the scriptures employ the word you or i in one meaning and we understand the i in a different sense in a different way therefore both these understandings are are explained here what is the general understanding that everybody has of the pronoun i what do they understand by i what do they understand by the self and what is the meaning in which the upanishad uses the word i or the self sthula shayira abhimani tvam pada vachyartha so here the word vachyartha is used watch the immediate meaning or literal meaning so when a word is uttered then the meaning that flashes in our mind immediately is called the immediate meaning literal meaning or vachyartha when we utter the word flower immediately a meaning flashes in my mind when it's a mango a meaning flashes in my mind when it's a pot word meaning flashes in my mind this meaning that flashes in my mind when the word is uttered or heard is the immediate meaning the meaning in which that word is generally understood every word is generally understood in a certain way and that understanding we have developed based on our own upbringing our own association or experience with the knowledge and with the objects of the world and therefore words are understood in conventional way when you say mango everybody knows what mango means when you say pot everybody understand what a pot means when you say cloth we understand what cloth means when you say horse we know what horse is elephant everybody knows what elephant is and thus when this words are uttered then they will create a meaning which is the vachyartha the literal meaning the immediate meaning <coughs> and similarly when somebody says you i know who i am who am i sthula shreera abhimani i take myself to be a limited being who is who takes this body to be myself and thus i equate the body to be the self i equate the mind to be the self i equate the cross and the subtle body to be myself this is called the identification so it is natural it is not that i decided to identify one day identification is that which just happens and i don't even know while watching the movie i become so one with what i am watching that i forget my own identity and i become something that i am not it's not that i decided it happens and thus from the birth not from the birth from the time beginningless 
that has been this identification with this body gross and subtle bodies with my personality and this personality has been discussed in great detail in Tattva Bodha at in the beginning it was said it consists of this thula, sukshma, karana, sarira, the subtle, the gross, subtle, causal bodies. Or it consists of the five koshas, the annamaya, pranamaya, manumaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya. However, we analyze the personality. But an identification with the personality creates the sense of limitation. And that is how I know myself. Therefore, whenever you say, you, come here, do this. Then, who will I understand you is addressed? I, the individual being confined to this body-mind complex and limited to the body-mind complex, I am the one that is addressed. Please bring a glass of water. Well, who is being told? I, the individual sitting here is being told to do that. So, please sing that song. Okay, who is being told? The individual. And therefore, the, me the meaning in which I understand the word I is the one that is limited to this body-mind complex. Let's go vachyartha, the immediate meaning, the literal meaning, the meaning that will immediately flash when somebody says you to me. Then the meaning that flashes in my mind as to who I am is this one, limited being. But that is not the sense in which the word you is used by the scripture, so by the teacher. Upadha vidin muktam, samadhi dasha sambandham, suddham chaitanyam, chaitanyam, tvampada lakshartha. But the laksha targeted meaning. Laksha means the target. Targeted meaning. Meaning that is targeted when the word you is used by the Upanishad is what you really are. Meaning that the word, the meaning in which you understand the word you or I is not the true meaning. You are not what you take yourself to be. In fact, you are different. Who are you? So that is how the whole analysis was given. Sthula Sukshma, Kara Sarirad, one who is Yatirikta, one who is totally distinct from the gross, subtle and causal body. That's the gross body you are not. The subtle body you are not. The causal body you are not. Because you are the witness. The gross body doesn't always stay with you. It is not consistent. It is not faithful. In fact, it is vegetarian. It is now with you and not with you. Otherwise, in the dream state, the gross body is not there. In the deep sleep state, even subtle body also is not there. And you have knowledge, even ignorance also is not there. All of these are incidental. What is the inherent nature of yourself? What is the abiding reality about yourself? What is about yourself that is undeniable? That can be non-negatable, undeniable, that which always is. Shuddha Chaitanyam, that you are that you are Sat, you always are, Chit, you always shine, Ananda, that you are always, you are boundless. So what is the abiding reality or persistent truth about you? Is that or about me? I am, I am, I am, is undeniable. And how do I know I am? Because that I am is self-revealing. I am in Sat, it is self-revealing. That is it. And as we said the other day, it is boundless and therefore is ananda. So unqualified existence or unqualified awareness or unqualified happiness is that is the happiness or the freedom which is unconditional. So unqualified existence, unqualified awareness, unconditional happiness, that's what you are. You are not what you take yourself to be. But when do you find this out? When do you discover this nature of yourself? Samadhi dasha sampannam. Tena tyaktena bhunjitaha. When you give up this? When you give up the identification, the false identification. And identification is given when the inquiry into the true nature is 
is connected, it makes sense. The gross body I cannot be. I possess the body all right, but then I am not the body. I possess a mind all right, I am not the mind. I possess an intellect all right, I am not the intellect. I possess this thing, just as I possess various ornaments. I don't call them I, and similarly also, this body, the prana, the mind, the intellect, all of these I possess. They are not I. So, what is meant by samadhi here is that when we drop this identification, in, in light of this vivek or the discriminative knowledge between the self and the non-self, where I think is one, in fact there are two entities. And so these two are taken to be one. This is called a moha or a vivek or delusion. And the only way to come out of that delusion is to recognize the two as two. That personality is a costume that I am wearing. And this body-mind complex is a costume. I am the one that is putting on this costume, totally different from the costume. And what then, what does I reduce to? All the qualifications are all gone because they all belong to the Upadhi. Therefore, Shuddham Chaitanyam, unqualified awareness, unconditioned awareness, Samadhi Dasha Sampannam, Samadhi. Then when my identification is totally placed on who truly I am, so letting go or withdrawing the identification from this body-mind complex and establishing in my own self, that is called Samadhi, when there is absorption in my own self. I am always absorbed in myself, understand, I am always in Samadhi with myself. I am always in Samadhi with myself because I am never away from myself. So all that needs to be done or needs to happen is that this conclusion about I has to change. I don't have to abide in myself because I am always abiding. Because I self-revealing the mind, it is the self of the mind also. Mind can never get away from the self. Just as an ornament can never get away from gold. Or a part can never get away from coal and so also. I mean part from clay, so also. I, the, I can never get away from the self. It is not that I have to center myself on myself. I am already centered. But along with I. So when I use the word I, not only the consciousness, but many other things also get included. Right now when I use the word I, then many things get included. The body also gets included. The sense organs also get included. The mind, all these things are included. So they are all, uh, they are all the, un, you know, tenants without any rent, you know. <laughs> or these are the fellows who are traveling with me without ticket. Like traveling the train and ten people travel with me in my mind, you know. The mother-in-law, father-in-law, these, all those fellows are bothering me. They all travel with me without ticket. So these fellows are all traveling with me without ticket. So, then, then that is let go. So all that needs to happen is that the meaning of the word I has to change, understand? The meaning of the word I has to change because right now the word I is used in a wrong meaning, in a wrong sense. Swami says, I is the most abused word. The word I, capital I, is the most abused word only because it is generally employed in a wrong sense. And therefore, the burden of the whole teaching is that the meaning of what I becomes what it should be. That all these other things that are lumped together in I. And how do you drop them? Dropping is not a physical process. You don't have to physically do something to, to send the body away. Nothing is to be physically done. Because in reality, the eye is never actually mixed up. Just as when a crystal, even when it appears to be pink, it is not pink and therefore it's not that you have to somehow decolor, bleach the crystal. We don't have to bleach the crystal. We have to recognize that even when it looks pink, in fact, it is not pink, by recognizing that the color belongs to something else. <coughs> of course, then it's always a good idea to remove that. You can remove the flower 
and see the crystal as it is. And similarly, we remove the influences of this body-mind complex and see the self as it is. Samadhi Shasampannam Shuddham Chaitanyam Tattvam Pada Lakshartha So meaning in which the word you is used by the teacher is not as you understand it because your understanding is not right. What you truly are is just unqualified pure consciousness or existence or wholeness. That's what you are. In that sense, the word is used by the teacher. And therefore, you should know yourself in that way. Tattvamasi. What's the meaning in which the word tat is used? What is meaning by of? So tat means Ishvara. That's what we understand. So in what sense the pronoun tat is used by the teacher? So the next sentence is <coughs> evam sarvajnyatvadi vishishtaha Ishvaraha tat padavachyarthaha upadi shunyam Shuddha Chaitanyam Tat Padalakshyartha Evam Sarvajnyatvad Vishishtha Ishvara Tat Padavachyartha And so also whenever we, whenever we use the word Ishvara immediately comes in our mind the, the entity that is omniscient omnipotent, the creator, sustainer, dissolver, right? So Ishvara or God is always understood as that, as one who is the creator of the universe, the one who is the, the ruler, one who is all-knowing, one who is omnipotent. So that is the meaning that immediately flashes when the word Ishvara is used. When word Brahman is used, Ishvara is used, God is used, then the meaning that immediately flashes in the mind is one who is vast in knowledge, in power, in every way, one who is infinite. That is the vachyartha, tatpada vachyartha, the immediate or the literal meaning of the word tat of word Ishvara. However, in Ishvara also if you analyze what is the abiding nature in Ishvara, what is abiding? In Ishwar also there is something that is changing and something that does not change. Just as in I also there is a changing element and there is that which does not change. That I am a man or woman is subject to change. I don't always think that I am a man or woman. When I become an emotional being, I forget that I am, a, you know, I sometimes not even aware of the body. Sometimes I become so absorbed in something that I don't even know where I am sitting. So it's not that I'm always aware of this body or I'm always identified the body. Even in the waking state, I'm not always identified the body. Very often I am not. Thus when we are absorbed in listening to music, reading something, writing, thinking, you know, working on a problem, at that time one forgets hunger and so everything is forgotten. People thus, that is how we ignore their health sometimes because they are so preoccupied with something. That time there is no awareness of the body. It's not that I'm always identified with the body. I do find myself as free from the body. So this body is the changing element. I'm not even always aware of my emotions. They also go away. The problems also go away very often when my mind is absorbed in something else. So we find that all these notions about myself drop off very often in your own experience. It is not the notion that I am a human being always remains with me, no. That is a husband, wife, these are not always remain. Other notions take over them. So which is that which is ever persistent? Every notion about I arises and it goes away, it's all changing, all incidental. In all these notions, what is that persists? I am, I am, I am. That's all that persists. Everything else is all subject to change. Including my conclusion that I am limited, even that also is not always that, that I don't know anything, I am so small, I am so little, etc. Even that also goes away often. So just as 
the tattvam pada lakshartha the targeted meaning of the word you or that is i is simple i am am that's all am means existence and it is always known it is self shining self shining existence self revealing existence or self existing awareness that is the meaning that is i Similarly, also about God, what is it that is always there? And there also there is a changing element, and there is a changeless element in God also. Because when He is Creator, He is not sustainer. When He is sustainer, He is not dissolver. When He is one, He is not there. There also God has so many roles. Just as I have so many roles also, as Upanishad says, Pranandeva Prana Bhavati Vadan Vak. Pashyan Chakshuhu, Shruman Shrutram. So I become a speaker when I identify the organ of speech, become hearer when I identify the organ of hearing, become thinker when I identify the organ of thinking. Thus all these roles keep coming and going. Like an actor assuming variety of roles which come and go. Like some children played in, had a role in three things, you know. He becomes stone in one role and becomes something else in some other role. Who is he? The one who can change the roles has to be different from the roles. Even speaker now, here or then, thinker some other time, then, these are all different roles. Who is the one who is persistently there in all the roles? I am, I am, I am. And so also, Ishwara has many roles, and therefore, he is called by so many names. He is called Brahma, when his role, when he is in the role of creator. He is called Vishnu, in the role of preserver. He is called Rudra in the role of destroyer. And he is called by so many other names depending upon what function he performs. So who is Ishvara without these roles? Who is Ishvara without these upadhi, without these costumes? Even creators, see when there is total dissolution, when Prala is there, at that time there is no creator. When the whole world becomes dissolved, when the whole world goes to sleep, and that is a state of pralaya or dissolution, at that time there is no creation. Just as when we are fast asleep, that time there is no waking, there is no dream. And so also Ishwara is fast asleep. When? In the state of dissolution. That time he is not creator, he is not sustainer, he is none of this. That means all these roles that Ishwara also plays, they are all also subject to negation. What is about Ishwara that never gets negated? Just says, what is about me that never gets negated? Even deep sleep state that I am. Because when I wake up, there is a recollection that the one who was sleeping is the one who is woken up. And so also, what is it that always is consistent, persistent? Even about Ishvara, even his omniscience, omnipotence, all of these also are not there in a state of dissolution. But Ishvara is. The easiness never goes. Even when Ishvara is sleeping, he is. And he's shining. So he is, he's shining, it never goes. And therefore, Upadi Shunyam, Shuddha Chaitanyam, Tatpat Lakshyartaha. Only Vedanta can say this. Nobody in the world has the courage to say that Ishvara is simply consciousness. They will think, what? Ishvara is only, he's always omniscient, omnipotent, all is this. That's okay. But Ishvara also sleeps. The whole world also sleeps at some time. Just as we wake up from the sleep and go back to sleep. So also the whole universe is cyclic. The whole universe wakes up. That is called the creation. It goes to sleep. Avyaktat vyakta sarvaha prabhuvanti haragame ratriagame pradiyante tatraiva vyakta sanyake. Says Bhagavad Gita that from the unmanifest all of these become manifest. When the day breaks, at night again they go back into man- unmanifest. So e- even Ishwar also is not consistently one thing. And everybody has different uh, different opinions about Ishwara. So some people think he's very kind, some will think he's very cruel, some will think he's fair, some will think he's unfair, and whatever. 
but about Ishvara also. What is that? It's non-negatable, undeniable that Ishvara is, he is, shines, and therefore Shuddha Chaitanyam. So Maya is a Vesha. Ishvara puts on the costume of totality. When he puts on the costume of individuality, he comes to be called Jiva. When he puts on the costume of totality, he comes to be called Ishvara. You remove the costumes. It's plain and simple. Shuddha Chaitanyam. That self-shining, self-revealing consciousness, boundless consciousness, everything ultimately results into that. <clears throat> and so the next sentence is, Evam Jeeveshwara Yoho Chaitanya Rupena Abhede Badaka Abhavaha Evamcha, in this manner, Jeeveshwara Yoho of Jiva and Ishvara Chaitanya Rupena Abhede Abhede Badaka Abhavaha there is nothing that really obstructs this abheda or non-duality. When? Chaitanya Rupena. So when it comes to the Upadhi, at the level of Upadhi, yes, there is a Badhaka. See, the question is that Jiva and Ishwara are identical. That's a statement of Upanishad. But then there is a Badhaka. There is something that comes in the way of that, of, of the, the truth of the statements. And that is what? The Upadhi. So, Upadhi Rupena. At the level of Upadhi, there is, the identity is not there between Jiva and Ishvara. Meaning that I can never be Lord Krishna or Narayana or Shiva at the level of Upadhi. I can never create. Even when I become totally absorbed, uh, abiding in the knowledge, even then I cannot create this world. I can't sustain it. I can't lift a mountain. I cannot do those things. But still, I can be identical with Ishvara in as much as so Nara and Narayana, Arjuna is Nara, Lord Krishna is Narayana. Nara and Narayana both are said to be the manifestation of the same Lord. Dvasuparana, Sayuja Sakha, the, the two birds, in the self same tree, they can be one at the level of Chaitanya. Meaning that when all the complexes are given up, Upanishad says, Sayas Chayam Purushe. Yascha Savaditya Sai Kaha The one that obtains in the individual being, one that obtains in totality, is Eka, is one. It's a big statement that the, that which is the truth of the individual is the truth of the total. Evam Pinda Brahmandeho Aikyam Samhudam That is truth of the Pinda, the individual, is the truth of the Brahmanda. What is the truth of an atom? is the truth of a mountain. Because the truth is the same. Anahoniyan, mahato mahiyan, atma sajantoho, nihito guhayan. He is smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. He is equally present in the smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. <clears throat> that sat or existence is equally present, is fully present in the smaller than the smallest and the bigger than the biggest. The small also is Upadhi. The big also is Upadhi. Small also is a costume. Big also is a costume. Same sat, same existence, same Satchidananda comes in a small thing as well as in a big thing. Take the flower, Asti, Bhati, Priyam. The flower is, the flower shines and the flower is Dear. Flower is a name, it is a form. So thus, this flower has five aspects. Name, form, is, shines and is dear. And so this little flower also. It is, it shines, it is dear, it is a name, another name. Maybe jasmine, name and form. So also the cloth, so also the table, so also the swami and so also anything in the creation is it shines, it is dear, it is a name, it is a form. Thus, Asti, Bhati, Priyam, that Satchit Ananda is equally present, is wholly present in every name and form. 
it can be the small and the smallest minuter than an atom then also asti bhadi priyam is in the total measure it can be larger than the largest and so also still asti bhadi priyam is the is present in the fullest measure and therefore yes from the point of view of the size the two they are not equal from the point of the abilities they are not equal from the point of the essence they are equal and therefore a wave and the ocean are equal in as much as each one of them is water a small little earring and a whole huge lump of gold are equal in as much as both of them are gold bhadak abhav so the question was asked how can there be identity between i who is so small and alpagnya ishwa is sarvagnya so this called bhadak bhadak means that which comes in the way that which is that which negates or which obstructs so yes the idea that arises from the identification of the upadhi obstructs the idea of oneness but when the upadhi is given up and this has to happen the giving up the upadhi giving up identification giving up the notion of smallness now that is a process and therefore first this giving up the notion should happen as a yoga as process and that is where karma yoga bhakti yoga comes that every time the notion of smallness arises which prompts me to do something self sense selfishly you know then i have to replace it by saying no this is not right you are not that and therefore your selfishness is not justified so i keep not keep not justifying all these notions that arise from my perceived sense of smallness and by pratipaksha bhavana i keep on replacing by by the truth of what i am by the bigness this i try to become fake it that i am big until i make it and finally i see myself as upadi shunyam upadi nirmuktam shuddha chaitanyam <coughs> so this vedanta teaches us all the time this tyaga or renunciation the first and that what is renunciation renunciation of the identification with this upadi which brings up the idea of smallness renunciation of sense of smallness and that sense of smallness pervades every little every grain of my being every activity every thought every desire is pervaded by this sense of smallness every thought that arises in my mind every emotion every desire is all prompted from or originated from the sense of smallness and never it is renunciation of the sense of smallness and finally the renunciation happens in the form of deidentification with the upadi but that won't happen right away right away it just remains words when i say that i am not this body but it becomes reality when i act as one if my life reflects that principle that in reality i am limitless or i am free and thus i live a life that is based on that truth that living the life is called yoga which ultimately becomes a reality for me <clears throat> so there is no bypassing this process of self growth understand so knowledge that's why sadhana chatur sampann adhikarana moksha sadhana bhutam tattva ek prakaram vakshyama that is why the teaching will immediately impact the one who is essentially become free from this complexes and so it's letting go of the complexes which all arise from ignorance not giving reality to my complexes my notions <clears throat> and this identity is taught like this very famous story of a lamb and a lion you must have heard this a little lion cub it seems that the mother lion gave the birth to a little lion cub and she died there and then and this little cub was picked up by a cowherd person who had a whole host of lambs with him and then this lion cub also grew along with lambs along with sheep and thought that i am also a sheep because that's what he sees everywhere he also makes noises like a sheep and he just grew up as a sheep 
So once upon a time a real lion came and all the sheep started running away naturally when the lion comes and this little thing also started running away and lion was amazed. He says, I can understand all the sheep is running away from me. Why this lion come? Why is this running away from me? So he chased it, caught hold of him. He says, oh please let me go, don't kill me. I am just a little sheep, you know, please let me go. I won't let you go. Let me go. Who are you? I am a sheep. And it made a noise also like sheep. See, I am a sheep. Come with me. Okay, everybody was let go. This fellow was, come with me. Okay. Was taken to a pond of water. So look inside. He looked inside. What do you see? I see myself. How does, how do you look like? Look at me. He says, yes. Look at yourself. Look at me. Look at yourself. How do you look like? You look like you. Look again. How do you look like? I look like you. Who am I? You are a lion. Then who are you? I am a lion. And that lambness is gone. In recognition that I am a lion. He is holding on to the notion I am a lamb and behaving like a lamb and suffering like a lamb in spite of being a lion. So that's all Vedanta does. You are not a lamb, you are a lion. You take yourself to be a lamb and thus this Jiva Ishwara Vaikyam, lion is like the Ishwara, this lamb is like a Jiva, meaning the one who takes himself to be Jiva. Identity is taught that way by giving him the real acquaintance or real understanding of his true nature. <clears throat> so that lamb could never believe that I can be lion. How can I be? But when it comes to see its true self, then it recognizes. Evam cha jiveshvaryo ho chaitanya rupena abhele badak abhavaha Thus there is no badaka. There is nothing that obstructs, nothing that comes in the way of the identity between Jiva and Ishwara. <coughs> and so the next sentence is Evamcha Vedanta Vakyahi Sadguru Padeshe Naja Sarveshwavi Bhuteshu Yesham Brahma Buddhi Putpanna Te Jivan Muktaha Bhavante Evamcha and in this manner Vedanta Vakyahi by the statements of Vedanta and there is only one Vakya Tatpamasi that's Vedanta Vakya only one sentence or a sentence similar to that what is meant by Vedanta Vakya is Mahavakya the major statement that reveals the identity between Jiva and Ishvara or Jiva and Brahma, that's called Vedanta Vakya. Vedanta Vakya is Sadaramanta. That is this Vakya. Tattvamasi, Ham Brahmasmi, Soham. Evam Vedanta Vakya. In this manner, with the help of the statements of Vedanta, this is called a Mahavakya, a major statement, which reveals the identity between Jiva and Brahman. Other vakya are avantara vakya. They are secondary statements or supporting statements. So, you know, between them that becomes the whole text. Because teacher doesn't say you are Brahman and stops there. He elaborately explains what is meant by you, what is meant by Brahman, what is meant by R. So, each of these statements. So, when Tat is explained, it is called avantara vakya. Tvam is explained, avantara vakya. Asi is explained, Mahavakya. Even Vedanta Vakya, by this statement, the teaching of Vedanta. Sadguru Padeshe Nacha, which Vedanta is taught by Sadguru. Sadguru means the one who is Guru of Sat. So Guru is teacher, but Sadguru is a teacher of Sat, a teacher of truth, a teacher of the self. One who knows the self and one who has the ability or the skill, or the knowledge, or the facility to impart that knowledge also <coughs> by the teaching of Sadguru, a competent teacher. 
सर्वेशु भूतेशु येशाम ब्रह्म बुद्धि उत्पन्ना दोस नाउ हु अप्रिशिएट द प्रेजेंस ऑफ ब्रह्मन एवरीवेयर सर्वेशु विभूतेशु इन ऑल द बीइंग्स दोस अप्रिशिएट दैट इन ऑल द बीइंग्स द सेम नारायण सेम शिवा सेम लॉर्ड सेम ब्रह्मन सेम आई ते दैट मींस दोस अंडरस्टैंड और दोस अप्रिशिएट द फैक्ट ऑल द रेज इज वन आई कॉल इट ब्रह्मन कॉल इट सेल्फ बिकॉज the word i no more means now the individual self te jivan mukta bhavanti they become liberated even while living jivan ta hai mukta hai even when they are living they are liberated as lord krishna says vidya vinay sampanne brahmane gavihastini sunijeva swapake cha panditah samadarshinah the wise people are samadarshinah they see the same truth everywhere vidya vinay sambandhe brahmane in a brahman and very pious person also gavi in a cow hastini in an elephant suni in a dog in a pious person to the entire range to the most impure person in all of them one who sees the same truth recognizes that the truth does not become impure because of the impure upadhi or the costume it doesn't become purified because of the purity of the costume as i said yesterday as that sweeper told shankaracharya that the sun does not get contaminated just because it gets reflected in the sewage water and doesn't become sanctified because it gets reflected in the in the ganges water it remains ever the same and so so don't appreciate asti bhati priyam in every name and form the truth is asti bhati priyam well one appreciates the names and forms at the level of sense perception but at the same time does not lose sight of the fact that this is asti bhati priyam this sat chit ananda and that is i one who sees everywhere the manifestation of the same self in all the names and forms one in whose vision there is nothing but one self one non dual self it is not even that the name and form are different they are a dependent reality they are mithya meaning that they are just the costumes of the vehicles for manifestation of asti bhadi prem or sachidananda and therefore one who appreciates sachidananda as one's own self and as the self of all in his perception now there is nothing but one non dual truth every kind of difference or distinction is erased in whose mind in whose perception in whose vision there is no difference whatever recognizing that all the differences are apparent created merely by the costumes of name and form and that even when those apparent differences are there at the level of chaitanya at the level of essence of the truth there is no difference whatever that there can be thousands of waves in the ocean but then there is only one water there can be thousands of pots and pans there is just one clay it's one clay that manifests all these pots and pans and one water that manifests all the waves and so also one self that manifests the whole universe of names and forms one who is this vision te jivan mukta bhavanti they become liberated even while living vimuktasya vimuchyate they do not become liberated they discover themselves to be liberated one who is liberated becomes liberated even though it says they become liberated as though they were bound understand that the bind bondage was only in terms of notions because real bondage can never go bondage is notional having given that up or that bond is being dropped in light of the knowledge they own up their freedom that's all other people even though are free are deprived of the benefit of freedom because they don't own it up even though the fellow is the 10th man is deprived of the benefit because he doesn't own up that doesn't appreciate that so it's not that only jivan mukta is liberated everybody is liberated ever free except that one has to discover you know enough that i am free i should know that i am free it's not enough that i am brahman i should know that i am brahman they become jivan mukta 
so they become liberated while living and such vedanta teaches that the liberation of freedom has to come while we are alive is not a phenomenon to take place after death is not a phenomenon to take place in some other embodiment this is the embodiment the human embodiment and here that it has to happen <clears throat> so one should not plan for something happening after death that I'll go to heaven or some place in this hell no it has to happen right here so now when the teacher uses the word jivan mukta then it raises a question so the student asks the next question here nanu jivan mukta kaha hey who is jivan mukta sir you said that this is very fascinating he is liberated even while living without liberation when he comes when he leave this body how can you be liberated as long as the body is there looks like that so called jivan mukta is as limited as we are what is meant by liberation what is meant by freedom does it mean that now a free person can do whatever he wants so he can fly in the air will he read all my mind does he know all the languages Does he can can he perform all miracles? Can he do what he wants to do? He can eat what he wants, drink what he wants, go where he wants. What is my mind liberation? Well, that's our idea of freedom. Our idea of freedom is the freedom, the license to do what I want to do. But they said whoever claims that kind of freedom is never free because that person may not follow maybe the code of conduct that is imposed by the world but then he is then controlled by his own impulses anyway so what is freedom freedom is not just the license to do what you want you may that is you know that is the greatest bond in fact freedom is the freedom not to do what is not necessary that's all and so freedom is described not in terms of his behavior not in terms of his conduct freedom is described in terms of his knowledge because bondage is only in terms of ignorance in as much as bondage is only of the nature of my conclusion therefore freedom also is only of the nature of the removal of those false conclusions as he has in as much as bondage is of the nature of the false perception the freedom is of the nature of true perception and so next passage t- tells us what that who the jivan mukta is <coughs> यहाम पुषोहम ब्राह्मणोहम शूद्रोहमस्मी दृढ़ निश्चय तथा ना ब्राह्मण न शूद्र न पुष कि असंग सच्चिदानंदस्वूप प्रकाशरूप सर्वाया चिदाकाशरूपस्मी दृढ़ निश्चय अपरोक्षवान्वन्मुक्त so the last statement is aparoksha jnanavan jivan mukta hai one who has this immediate knowledge about one's own self is called liberated even while living <coughs> aparoksha jnanavan the one who has aparoksha jnan immediate knowledge the knowledge that is not mediated by either sense organs or the mind the immediate knowledge <coughs> so let us see what is aparoksha jnan So the example is given here yasa dehoham purushoham brahmanoham shudroham asmiri dhrudh nischaya so right now how do i have how i have a firm conviction a firm conclusion or the firm conviction about myself i have aparoksha gyanam right now also i have the immediate knowledge about myself so it's not that we don't know what aparoksha gyanam is i know myself and i know myself without the intervention of the sense organs i know who i am without having to see myself or hear myself or touch myself or without thinking also i know 
You wake me up in the, at midnight and ask me, who are you? I'm Swami so and so. Right away I will tell. Thus there is Dhrana Nishya, a firm knowledge, a firm conclusion, a firm knowledge. What is it? Dehu hum, I am the body. Although nobody declares I am the body, what's the consequence? Purusho I am a man. Brahmano I am a Brahmana. Shudra I am a Shudra. That depends upon the culture. What I call myself depends upon the culture. So in the Vedic times the culture is like this, that one identify oneself based on the Varanashrama, to what Varana or caste I belong to, what ashrama or stage I belong to, accordingly we identify ourselves. In some other culture one may identify in different way. Whatever it is. But I am very clear. It is, there is no doubt about the fact that I am a human being. That I am a man. Or that I am a woman. No doubt about that. And that's an abiding knowledge. It's knowledge without for which I have to think not at all. No, no thinking required. And how do I know that? This is my knowledge right now that I am a human being. How do I know? Do I have to see myself as a human being? Is it a sense, sensory knowledge? Or is it knowledge of thinking? No, it is immediate knowledge. So right now also the immediate knowledge that I am a human being or I am so and so. That is where the change has to happen. And at that level it has to happen otherwise it will not bless me. Because this conclusion on my part that I am a human being, that I am a limited being, so deeply rooted. That is where the knowledge that I am Brahman has to take place to displace that. So that is the case with the wise person. So just for, as for an ignorant person, he is very clear that I am a man or a woman or a Brahman or a Kshatriya or whatever I am. So clear or spontaneous. This is habitual but spontaneous knowledge. So, I am Brahman, I am not a Brahman, I am not a Shudra, I am not a Purusha, I am not a, I am not a human being. Not that I am not a human meaning that I am not this body, that is idea. And as much as that I am a human being is an idea arising from identity in the gross body. Taking the body to be myself brings up all these ideas or conclusions in me. But, Naham Brahman, Brahman, Purusha, Shudra, all of these are the attributes of, the, of the, this body. I have a body, but I am not the body. In fact, even I don't have a body also. It is not that I am, not only I am not the body, the body ultimately is not mine also. Because I am the self of all and therefore I am not confined to any one thing. Still, you may say that because we pass samskaras, there may be a specific relationship with the body and therefore the wise person also continues to act in a certain way as he or she used to do. That's okay. But there is no identification. If you are not a human being, you are not a person, you are not a man, not a, not a Brahmana, not a Shudra, not a father, not a mother, not a Brahmachari, who are you? Asanga hai, Satchidananda Surupa hai, Asango hai, Purusha hai. This Purusha, the person is Asanga, unconnected, unattached. Are we not? If we are this body, we can never sleep, you know. When can I go to sleep? When I leave this body as it is, without any concern about it, is it not so? When I go into deep sleep, do I bother about the body at all? How does it look like? Right now I am so conscious about me. So I may I take a picture? Yes, please take a picture. Let me, you know, after. Let me, all right, now you take the picture. But when I am sleeping, take the picture? You know, whichever way I am sleeping, no objection at all. Why? There is no self-consciousness. I have left this body without any concern. That is called detachment. No thought of it. Asangohyam purushaha. I am totally unconnected to the body. Had I not been, I, I can't leave it like that. Do you know that when we are sleeping, we go into a different realm, different world. In the dream, we are in a different world. Deep sleep also in a different realm, leaving this body, going to different realm, we'll come back later. The dream world also I live just like that, the waking world I live like that, 
the dream will also I just drop it when I go to deep sleep and that also I drop it when I'm with myself and that shows that I'm totally a sangha, I'm unconnected had I been connected with them I could never get rid of them asangoham sachinananda swarupah asangoham 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 punah punah sachidananda rupoham ahameva madvaya who am i i am simply sachit i am i shine i am complete sachidananda rupah that unqualified there is no qualification free from qualification or attributes Prakasha Rupa, same thing, of the nature of Prakasha, light or consciousness, ever shining, Tameo Bhantam, Anubhadisaram, ever shining, ever revealing. Sarvan Dariyami, the self of all. I am not confined to this body mind complex, I am the self of all. Chidakasha Rupa, words, same things, Prakasha Rupa, Chidakasha Rupa. So these are the words that are used in scriptures in different places, therefore they are brought here. Just to make us acquainted with this term so that, as I said, then when you go to other texts, then you are familiar with what it means. Chidakasha. Akasha means space. Chidakasha. Chid means consciousness. So consciousness, which is like space, which is formless, the formless, boundless consciousness I am. So on account of Shravanam, Mananam, Dhiridhyasanam, one who has removed the ignorance, the doubts as well as habitual errors, and one therefore has the abiding knowledge, a spontaneous knowledge. That Dhiridhyasanam, that spontaneous knowledge one has. And the example is, as spontaneous right now, the knowledge is that I am a man or a woman. How spontaneous it is. You say something about women, immediately you can see the expression on the face, what are you talking? Say something about, you know, whatever, immediately. Because very clear that I am a woman. Say something about wife, immediately the eyebrows, you know. This male chauvinist, what are they talking about? That I am a woman, very clear. That I am a man, very clear. I am white, black, brown, tall, short. Mama made a comment is made, somebody immediately reacts because they feel they are targeted. That shows how strongly we feel. That is abiding knowledge about myself. That is dhranishya. That is the firm conviction as to who I am. That is the spontaneous knowledge you call it. So spontaneous knowledge becomes that I am Brahman. He is Aparoksha Jnanavan. So one who possesses this immediate knowledge, he is called Jivan Muktaha, he is liberated while living. So thus, this knowledge brings about a total freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from all the notions about myself. Freedom from all the complexes about myself. Understand that the only bondage that we are suffering from, nobody has tied me with any ropes. Nobody is, you know, I, there is no reason why I should feel in any way helpless or, or you know, in no way I need, but I am. I am helpless not on account of the world around me, but I am helpless on account of my own notions of myself. The real bondage is nothing but those of my notions. They tie me down. That I am a woman, it's a no, that ties me down. That I am a man just ties me down. Anything that I talk about, anything I call myself, it just ties me down. Because I am that alone and nothing else. Every notion that I have is exclusive of every other notion. And then whenever I brand myself, I exclude everything else and I become excluded also. And so we pride ourselves in distinguishing ourselves, not recognizing that distinguishing myself means I am excluding myself. As Swami says, Mom and I declare this is my house. That means it's very clear that all the other houses in the neighborhood are not mine. The other development is not mine. The township is not mine. The city is not mine. The state is not mine. The country is not mine. The world is not mine. The universe is not mine. Mom and I say, this is mine. And so, so Mom and I declare, this is I. That means nothing else I am. 
in that there is this awareness that I am excluded by everything. There is an isolation, exclusion. And that is a bondage. What is meant by bondage in Vedanta is the sense of smallness, exclusion, isolation, insignificance, individuality that comes. It is simply a superimposition. It is not a reality about myself. And so better we understand bondage, better we understand what liberation is. Because lots of confusion obtains with reference to what is meant by moksha, what is meant by liberation. Because we have romantic ideas about what liberation is. Because as we grow up, we get fascinated by many things. Mainly by many miracles we get fascinated and therefore we always associate spiritual life, we always associate with miracles. And all great people are presented that way. With Jesus Christ, all miracles. Any Shankara, everybody is only miracles. That's what we understand. And that's how we revere them. We revere them because of miracles. But no. Miracle also may be something some special that the person possesses. Okay. Every great scientist creates miracles by discovering things. That's great miracles. Every artist may create a miracle because any act of wonderful creation is a miracle. But that also is the level of upadhi only. Our fascination and preoccupation with miracles gives us such a distorted perception of what spiritual life is. That we always in our own imaginary world about something happening, some miracle happening, some extra, some, some kind of power coming to me. So we always associate spiritual only with that. Spirituality is a simple process of inner purification. You don't have to achieve anything at all. Inner purification. That's all you need to recognize that you are the basis of all the miracles. In fact, everything is a miracle. You don't, we don't need any horns to grow here to discover that there is a miracle. I am a miracle. As I, as I am provided, I have the leisure to appreciate who I am. That I can walk and I can talk and I can, is a miracle. It's a great siddhi or great achievement. I have no value for that. So if I want some horns on my head, then I think it's a miracle. But the head itself is a miracle. Why don't you appreciate that? No, if I can walk six inches above the earth, then it is wonderful. But you can walk on the earth. There is not an ordinary thing. Enjoy that fact. Why do you think that you can enjoy only when it comes in certain costumes and, you know, in wrappers? Why can't you enjoy things as they are? For a free person, a Jeevan Mukta, there is life with nothing but enjoyment. Because all the obstacles to the misery, all demand, all of these are gone. Because the demands arose from his own complexes about himself. And they have always demanded of the world. Could never appreciate the world as it is. Could never appreciate himself as it is. Just appreciation of the way things are is plenty. Is in, that, is, that, is to, that is totality of wholeness in that. We don't have to create wholeness. We don't have to create something else to make it whole. As it is, it is whole. Purnameva avashishyade. In the vision of the wise person, all there is, is wholeness. It is to be seen, not to be created. Therefore, this whole pursuit of creation, creating, making, all of that has to drop. Then only the mind is poised to appreciate what is. <clears throat> and thus, the freedom or the liberation is simply liberation or freedom from one's own complexes, born of the wrong perception of oneself. And all that Vedanta does is to give us the root, true perception of ourself and true perception of the whole universe, you know, everything as it is, and just letting of the false perception. And that is freedom. Because freedom is already an obtaining fact, is not to be created. The self is ever free. Had it been bound, then it has to, the freedom has to be created. Ever free. So Upanishad says, Vimuktasya Vimuchyade. One who is already free becomes free. Meaning that he owns up the freedom. So Jivan Mukta is a very sim, sim, simple person. A liberated person is a very simple person. See, any great people, very simple people, 
nothing nothing extraordinary there's something very extraordinary also at the same time is very sim- there is simplicity also simple person simple non demanding person prajahati yada kaman sarvan parth manogadan that all the demands have dropped off all the needs have dropped off all the dependence has dropped off atmaneva atmana tushta hai because he has discovered that tushti or the satisfaction with himself by himself when i see that i am the satisfaction which is the truth about myself then i become free from all the needs or demands so liberation can also be said to be freedom from all demands freedom from all needs freedom from therefore all dependence it is my need that makes me dependent always at the back of the world please fulfill my needs so freedom means freedom from dependence freedom from helplessness <coughs> it is as simple as that there is nothing romantic about this nothing unusual about this because even after walking about the earth 6 inches still if somebody walks 9 inches about the earth then what and somebody flies in there then still the idea of superior inferior will always remain regardless of what i achieve <coughs> the freedom from the idea of inferiority then there is no superiority says chayam purushe yes cha savaditye sai kah whatever is the truth of this little individual is the truth of the whole universe and from that same point there is nothing superior nothing inferior but the level of upadi they always be comparisons superiority inferiority i can never become free from the sense of smallness even when i feel superior to somebody else is only another measure of another reflection of smallness only so understand what freedom means what moksha means what jivan mukti means <coughs> okay Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnamevavashishyate Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam Keshavam Vadarayanam Sutra Bhashya Krutau Vande ಭಗವಂತೋರಾತ್ಮೆ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓ